Well, you've, you've heard of some interesting speakers today, and we have them all lined up here, each in their, their own field of expertise, give some very interesting talks um, in their own time, and um, there's some interesting questions and talks coming out, and I hope over the period of since they've uh, spoken that you've had time to think of a few more questions to ask them. Uh, oh, thank you, John. <laughs> you around. I just had the beer. So, yeah, please fire some questions up here to the panel. They're here. You don't get often, often get a chance like this. Remember, it's the NBA that's done this. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to be here today. Yeah, and I have to try fly that flag. Thank you. So, yes, please, questions. One down the back. Has anybody given thought to the um, nutrition of the bees? In uh, normal life, everybody's saying we've got to eat healthy to keep our immune systems up. If you say bees' immune systems are not that good compared to mammals, um, has anybody given any thought to the type of plants uh, that the bees should be foraging from? Well, <laughs> yes, we have an expert in that. There's a young lady in the red top over there. Stand up, Linda. Stand up. Now don't introduce yourself that lady down here with the stroppy top on. <laughs> Linda heads the Trace of Bees program for the bee industry in New Zealand. And she's doing an enormous job and some of the results coming out of that now are absolutely fantastic and we need to applaud it. And please make sure you keep putting some money into it because we can't do it without money. Thank you. I'd add too that that's a joint Fed Farms NBA project. I'm involved in a project involved with in Gisborne where I come from. Uh, Linda's coming up there in early August. She's going to be working with the National Ar Arboretum up there called e Eastwood Hill. Uh, it's got something like 3,500 species of trees in there. And I've got hives in that Arboretum right now so that we can load up that Arboretum with bees and we can use that to uh, see what bees are working in different times of the year, particularly in the spring and the autumn. So, yep, it's definitely a project in, under train. We're also planting up an area on a nearby farm too as a trial area, but two in the South Island and Canterbury here. So yeah, that's, I think that's answering your question. Is there a roving mic? We can't hear. Can you stand up and talk that? I'd just like to know more about the PA problem you just you briefly mentioned in um, the protein supplements uh, for the hundred The Yeah, the, the, the concern there is that um, it, by feeding protein patties, because we've got a pollen shortage situation, uh, it's concerned that that lifts the protein levels too high and there may be a crossover, uh, carry, carry over into the honey, and maybe that's one of the reasons why we're seeing elevated seafood sugar levels. We don't know yet, but that's one of the concerns. I thought you mentioned that with regards to the No, sorry, no, that's to do with um, seafood sugars. My point is seafood sugars. I think I've got just another thing to add to that. Adding pollen patties at even early season, we've got to look at our bee practices, haven't we? So even early, well, we don't really know, do we? Not sure. Okay. There's another question down here. Yes. I'd like to just touch on the question about the bees and the bees. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. I'd like to just touch a little bit of that lady over there that spoke about the immune system of the bees and the connection of sugar, often white sugar or syrup, being fed to them. Now, I don't know what people know, but sugar is the greatest life shortener on the planet. If you look to see the nutrition, what it does to our bodies, now it depletes all the vitamins, especially the B and the C vitamins. The immune systems go down in the humans. Okay, we get cold, people get cold, things like that. No one has really done a study on the bees. Um, if you put uh, white flour, I'm a bit nervous, white flour and sugar <coughs> on the floor of a barn, the rats won't even touch it. And here we are, not me, people are giving it to the bees. It's bringing the immune, si immunity, or the immune system of the bees down. Now how long has this white sugar or sugar feeding been going on for? If you go right back 100 or 150 years, they didn't have sugar coming from America or where they grow the sugar cane and giving it to the bees. Now I know there's been a lot of research done on um, 
you know, build, building up the varroa resistance, working on the varroa, how to um, eradicate all that. What about letting the bees build up their immune system really, really strongly? And I wonder if they kept the very strong immunity, would the varroa have been attacking them? Now I know of two, and I know everyone says, I'm very nervous people, but I'm speaking for the bees. I know um, a lot of the feral or the wild hives, everyone says they've all died out. Everyone's died out. I know two amazingly strong wild hives that are incredible. They've been going on for years and years and years and years. There are millions of hives of bees around this tree, this tree I'm thinking of, and this other one I know of very personally. Um, now, what is people doing about um, doing this for the bees? Why, and the sugar is coming through on the, the importing thing. It's, it's bad. It's making a very refined honey. Natural bees in a natural environment are fed what they gather. We often, <coughs> if you think of all the wild animals, the animals, they have what they get. And okay, we could plant a lot of tree, trees for the bees, but why not give them what they deserve? I think they drive 5,000 miles to make one teaspoon of honey. Now we've only got to keep an extra couple of frames to give it back to the winter, so we eradicate sugar feeding. Now, I've said my piece. I hope people really can understand that because it's really part of it, very deep in my heart. So I hope you can answer this a wee bit. Thank you. Thanks for that, I really appreciate that because you raised a really good point. Can't hear. Uh, um, turn your mic on. That's better. Thank you for that because you raised a really good point about the way that we treat our bees. We, we often don't treat our bees correctly, we, we treat them like they're just going to produce our honey but in fact they are living organisms and you raise a really interesting point, we do need to start treating them as actually as animals again, we need to start looking and, and caring for them the way that they should be cared for but bringing it back to the varroa sensitive hygiene work that we've been doing, the, uh, the bees themselves now are starting to, um, the viruses are moving through the colonies because of the varroa that's in there because these varroa are, are amazing um, in terms of being vectors for these viruses. So they take them around and move them all through the colonies and all through the apiaries. And so the virus levels are building up. And so what we need to be doing is looking at ways that we can manage these virus levels. So things like um, replacing your frames regularly, your, your comb regularly, things like that to prevent the viruses staying within the colony for a long time. Just little things like that. And they're not gonna make a huge difference, but all of those things together in conjunction with all the other things that we're doing will have a big impact on the way that you look after your bees and the, and the health that your bees have. So thanks for raising that point, I appreciate that. I'd like to say one more thing. The, these two hives I know very well, they've never had been fed sugar. They've never had their combs renewed. They're in big trees, no one, man hasn't even touched them. And they are so healthy. Why isn't the varroa attack them and wipe them out? Uh, you'll probably find that they have, but what's happened is that you'll get an annual swarm, and because there's already honey in there and wax, and it's a fantastic attractant for new bees every season. So although it looks like it might be a, a colony that's continuing on year and year and year, it actually probably is just an annual swarm that's going in there every year. So um, at least you're out there every day checking I don't know if we could say that, it, yeah, you know? <laughs> so that's probably my take on that one. Thank you. Thank you. I think if you read the latest, my uh, presence report in the uh, last month's, uh, sorry, this month's uh, presence report in the beekeeper, I talk about sustainable practices regarding nutrition. It's hugely important um, and something that Linda and Tracy Bees are working on. There's, yeah, there's work being done on that. So, uh, yeah. Is it ever that will be banned? Like, you'll do the top right to make them unthinkable? I, I couldn't say that, I don't know. Um, it would be nice to reduce it right down to a minimal, because the more you, you know, it's a sustainable thing. If you can get most of your protein and your nectar and so on from the wild, why not? Yeah. They have a half the detoxifying enzymes of, say, a fruit fly, or that sort of thing. So there's all of those things that work against them. The 
Given that VSH is a naturally occurring additive genetic trait, within what time frame would it become a prevalent trait through natural selection? It probably won't, and the reason for it is because the varroa hasn't been in association with that type of bee for very long, so it hasn't had time to build up an immunity towards it and, and, and work, you know, collaboratively, if you want to put it that way, you know, the host parasite relationship hasn't, you know, been an easy transition for them. So basically, if you left it a colony to just um, live with the varroa, it will die. There's no, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking how long would it take? How many generations of bees would it take before the VSH becomes prevalent throughout New Zealand? How many generations? It's a hard one to put your finger on that one. I if everybody got in and started to get these B VSH bees and put them in their colonies and, and um, do it that way, then you, you might be maybe four years. But as a naturally occurring no, trait... No, no, they die. But it's an additive trait, so surely it's spreading naturally. Uh, and additive means that it, yeah, so if it, if it breeds, if you've got one breeding with another one that has VSH, then it will add to that and will increase. But if, um, unfortunately, with our bee uh, queens, they're, they're not monogamous, and so they'll make a whole bunch of other ones, so up to 18 queens, and so you're not going to get the VSH passed on and become additive. You, you, it's more likely for it to fall out of the population. So it's a degenerative trait. Degenerative, but additive, yeah. <laughs> Not as far as we can tell, we still need to treat for variety. Yeah. yeah. What made me say that was, was if you walk around, they're still surviving an hour. We've had yeah. variety for a while now, and I just wonder why, because they're pretty flat. Yeah. You know, flat uh, it, it could be just your virus level. You might be in an area where it's slightly isolated, so you haven't got the same sorts of virus component that we've got. Um, interestingly, when we first started doing research back in 2001 on Varroa, 2000, 2001, we looked throughout the world and we were looking at threshold levels, so how many mites can you keep in a colony before it's going to fall over? So in the States, they were talking around about sort of seven to 15,000 mites in a colony, uh, whereas you looked over in Europe and it was 1,500 to 2,500 mites in a colony. And then we looked here and we were we had 45,260 was our top number of mites in a colony. So we didn't have the same virus loading as what they had because they had it so many more years. So it could be that, that you might be slightly more isolated and your virus loading hasn't increased because of the vector of, of Varroa yet, but it will do, yeah. Just on the question of swarms, I'd just like to say that I've had Barrow and Gisborne region at my hive since 2003 and we still do find uh, swarms and trees occasionally. <coughs> They're not permanent hives, obviously. Well, who knows, it might have the, uh, another gene trait there. Yeah. We don't know, but um, yeah. Over the back. And is there anything we could do on a national level to educate general public about the dangers of abandoned hives because I mean I know there are abandoned hives where I am in North Canterbury that have just either people have bought them they don't know what to do with them and they've just left them in the field but um, they must be you know, breeding disease <coughs> and it would be great to get rid of them but probably the, the average person on the street doesn't realize I'll get France to ask this, answer this one I actually slightly missed your question could you repeat that again please it's just about abandoned hives hives that aren't looked after by anybody um, <coughs> Abandoned hives. Abandoned, hives. Abandoned hives is a specific process under the um, <coughs> under the pest management strategy order, which uh, requires that um, the management agency uh, attempts to find the owners of these hives. And um, current law requires them to uh, put a notice in the public public notice in the paper, and there's a series of processes. And if the beekeeper doesn't come forward, then we're permitted to destroy those hives. Yeah, yeah but I don't think that the average person realises that, that the quaint-looking hive that's fallen down in the corner of an orchard somewhere <coughs> is actually a danger to all of us because it could be just breeding disease. 
And I don't think most people realise that if there's a hive that hasn't been... Mm. I went to pick apricots two years ago, and there were some tumble-down hives in the corner, and the woman said, the man hasn't been back for five years. And she didn't realise that that was a problem. So could we not educate in some way? Well, it is a matter of public awareness, but um, it is also the landowner would, would also have to take some responsibility there. If the beekeeper hasn't turned up for five years, it's obviously a problem. Yeah, but she didn't know that. Yeah. But anyway, it's um, if there's issues with abandoned hives or people, uh, clearly uh, hives that have been uh, not looked at, looked at for some years, uh, contacting um, our contractors, Asia Quality, would uh, be a first step in the road. I think to <coughs> the uh, as for our go through, obviously South Island. And the, our experience in the north has been that you do actually get a spike in AFB because you do get these hives dying out and you will get people that will abandon them and they do sometimes carry AFB. So, yeah, that's one of the unfortunate side effects of varroa infestation. Yeah. Um, just getting back to getting this trade out to New Zealand, um, there's my way of thinking is um, we've, got, we've got a good trade here. Um, the fastest way, and we're, and we're pretty happy with it, the fastest way to get it out to New Zealand would be to give some of that drone semen to all the queen breeders um, free and to anybody else who breeds a significant amount of queens for their own operation. Um, I just think how we find it approaching it, it's quite slow um, and it's got a quite a high possibility of not taking place. It's happened overseas. Um, what does the panel think of that? Just putting dollars aside for a minute and thinking <coughs> about the bee industry as a whole. I think it's a fantastic idea. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is always a stumbling block, though, that it's, it's somebody's time and somebody's hives that they're not producing honey from or whatever because they've now turned it into a, um, a, a drone producing colony. <laughs> so if you can get around that, i.e. fund them to do that, then you can get them out there. But it's, that's what we've always talked about, if you can get drones out there, you're halfway there, well, you know, a third of the way there to getting the, the trait out there so that when you bring in uh, cells or you bring in uh, queens around and they produce you know, more cells and their virgins, and that when they go out and mate, you've got BSH stock out there with them to mate with. So it's a fantastic idea. And we did take on board that idea as well, and so that's why we've come up with the idea of selling hybrid queens, and if you buy a hybrid queen off us at market rate, then you're eventually taking on the, dr the drones. You need the drones for the semen. So that's our first plan of attack of getting them at, at, at straight out to the market. So to, to, to explain why that is so good is because the drone is a, is a replica of the mother. So you, you take the breeder and she's going to produce a bunch of random queens, but her drones are going to be really good. So that's how you could get them out there, just by, produce, by buying the breeder, the um, hybrid queens. So for the, if you're, if <laughs> if, you want to, if you get on board and you want to do and you want to, to be part of it and get it in through your, your operation, it's something that you're going to be bringing in each year. You're not going to be able to sustain it really in your own operation for a while. Is it something you have to keep going back to um, and, and keep bringing, reintroducing? And how long does that process go for before you can? I think it will depend on how coordinated the industry is. If you get everybody uh, producing, uh, taking hybrid queens on and producing these VSH drones and you're starting to use your own breeders in there, then it, you know that's, that's you guys that's done and these guys are out of a job. But the reality is that that's probably not going to happen. And so then, as, as we sort of talked earlier on, you need to decide, well, how often do you want to be assessing for this VSH trait in your, in, in your stock so that you can then increase and breed from those ones every year and, and increase that. So once it gets up to a particular level, it will stay at that level, but then it's only going to, um, with more stock that comes into your um, organisation, it's going to reduce again. So, so you can't really get your 
your own sustainable stock going? Like you, you can do, but you just have to do the assessments and whether you want to take the time to do all those assessments is the issue, yeah, yeah. And that's what we want to, we want to offer a service to do all the assessments and as well as then our main job will be keeping the, the VSH trait alive. So we'll, we can then, as soon as we've got it out to you guys as breeders, we can then concentrate on keeping keeping that VSH level up without getting too much in breeding and, and actually looking for other, hopefully by then we've got other breeders that we can source from as well. So that's why we need you guys to buy, come on board, so then we can then do do what they're doing in America and have have the base, you know, one base actually trying to keep, or not just one, but there'll be a couple hopefully with um, one. Yeah, yeah, well, we're, yeah, well, each year, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully um, we'll have at least six VSH breeders. Um, uh, we may have more, but we're going to come up with a program, or we'll come up with a program that we're going to keep crossing a couple of breeds each year to come up with another one, and then just keep them going, and then the following year cross two different ones, and then get, just keep it so we're not getting the inbreed sort of. So you have six, six going all the time, but then each year you'll get one and two cross, and then yeah. six still going, the next year you'll have three and five cross, the next year you'll have four and two cross, you know, so they can determine the genetic diversity each year, so you're not going to get the, all of the genes out there in a wild, crazy frenzy, and, and it's all going to shrink down in a tiny gene pool again. Right. Yeah. So, and these guys can pick their VSH? Quite high, still, they can keep it up still around the 70s or 80s. Yeah, probably aiming for 65 is probably a good reasonable level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's something these guys can do and then keep putting it out to the rest of us. Yeah. And then eventually, if we do testing and selection from our own operation, from, from perhaps salmon or bees brought from their operation, then eventually we'll get to the point where we are almost sustainable in our own. Area. Yeah, I think I think the point that um, Franz was raising earlier on, um, and it is a major issue, is genetic diversity in New Zealand stock. Um, so, if you just if we just look to say the, the cattle industry, they are always crossing their stocks and, and they are continually bringing a new stock into their farms and things like that. So we almost have to look at the beekeeping industry in a similar way. That now we're at a point now where we've got we've got some potential bottlenecks that are forming. We need to make sure that we widen those bottlenecks up again. And so the only way to do that is to have somebody managing that. We're in a place where we kind of we don't have that at the moment. And we've basically only got two breeders in New Zealand. We have a bunch of queen producers, but only two breeders really. And so we need to we've got a third one now, and so we need to balance that. So every year, every couple of years you might want it to be bringing in new stock because that's good for the health of your bees. Um, and then every second year you do your own and then so you're bringing in stock on a regular basis. Where do these guys get their new stock from? The, the breeders. So you guys have to, if you can do a feedback system, that's probably the best way to do what, it. So. What we're doing, and this isn't particularly do with VSH, but within our own program, we've run a closed breeding program called Rough Carry with 20 to 25 breeders, and even that number, you over a period of time, you will run into run into inbreeding problems. And so we, we have a system now where we have like a donor yard. <coughs> so people will say, oh, I've got this nice green or whatever. We run those in a separate yard for a while, decide whether we like the look of them, and then carefully bring that material back in. And so in a sense, it's a closed breeding program, but by adding some new material from time to time, you're trying to keep away from that situation. I think as far as VSH is concerned, because the VSH pool is, is smaller and smaller again, and it starts out small, um, then, then the idea of having like several lines in one program or several different programs across the country and actually from time to time doing the sex allele testing, see what alleles are required, and doing those trade-offs between the two, um, two or three different companies will probably help them all remain um, uh, sustainable for longer. Yeah, one of our current candidate queens for our breeding program provides one new sex allele. Uh, to the program, which is um, <coughs> probably uh, better than not having having 
um, none, but um, our previous one, before we did sex allele testing, we, we subsequently found it had no new sex alleles. That's why we didn't get a kick in the guts. Um, but uh, you know, so the problem is with closed populations is that um, you have to be very careful in how you manage your genetic diversity. And that sex allele testing is part of that whole mission. And running, especially close, very small populations, you end up with uh, get running into breeding problems quite quickly. And if you don't understand that, the whole system falls over very, very rapidly. And, and I, I do wonder about that a little bit. That is the BSH sort of the, the genetic genome that you have We know that we did first got in stock from all around the country, so there were 65 queens. Of those, at least a third to two thirds all had VSH trait, admittedly at low levels. So what that means is that there's there's quite a lot of st within those those six lines that we've got. They're not just the pure one line. Like that. It doesn't mean that it was a single queen in that one. You know, we we mixed some um, because we didn't have particular drones. And although we were only doing single drone inseminations early on, and then double drone inseminations, and then and then um, they we were mixing between a couple of lines or, or changing lines just because we we weren't able to um, we didn't have the drones available at the time we needed to produce the queens or vice versa. So. We, we have got some of the mixes, so these six lines, they might have, you know, two or three from those initial lines, two or three different queens from those initial lines, so there, there is differences within that, within those queens. There hasn't been, a lot of the stuff that we talk about with genetic diversity is all theoretical. So we haven't seen any bottlenecks here. Um, a lot of the stuff, um, is is really just theoretical so we just have to keep that in mind and we want to make sure that we keep the diversity really wide um, but we don't have any proof that it's going to fall over because of gen uh, lack of genetic diversity so we just to keep that in mind um, if you think back to the you know cheetah populations they've got 99.9% .9 the same genes but they're still alive you know what I mean so it's we just have to be careful with how it's a factor that we need to keep in our minds, yeah, and work towards that and prevent that from causing any damage in the future. So we're still either the game in that one, if, yeah, um, probably five years. We just we're here now, and so in five years' time, if we if we don't manage our stuff properly, then we might end up with issues five to ten years down the track, ten or twelve. In terms of uh, mathematical modelling for inbreeding. Um, it's usually quite interesting that um, you usually need a stable population to last, you know, 50, 100 years without any problems. You'd have to have around 100 in, uh, breeder each year. You have to have 100 individual queens providing genetic material. Uh, 50 queens would last you about 30 to 40 years, and then if you run about five or six queens, if you don't um, introduce new material, you might only get five to 10 years before things become um, problematic. So it's bees themselves that do have a, a their haploid diploid breeding strategies cause a, a huge amount of inbreeding issues over and above that. Say so mammals, you uh, they're a lot harder to inbreed, whereas the inbreeding process is a lot slower. Bees are a bit of a um, bit of a self-destructive uh, system that develop their eco their ecological responses to uh, pathogens and other things have worked on a different a different method. And unfortunately, um, <clears throat> sometimes it's not to their advantage, especially when they come across a revolutionary parasite like Varroa mite. Sorry, was someone over here had a question? No? Uh, yes. I, I was just wondering, um, given that the um, VHS is being passed on to industry, um, is Fort Research planning to do any further work on um, Varroa um, control or? Um, yeah, so the next lot of work that we're doing um, is through Capability Fund actually, which basically means that government gives us, uh, Crown Research Institutes, a bunch of money to work on areas of capability. So basically if you know the beekeeping industry stood up together and says, oh, we want to do a whole bunch of research on this, we'd say, yep, we're good, we can partner with you. If you, you've got some money, we can partner with you on that one. So that's where you do really need a good industry group. But oh, back, to the, back to the point, um, we're doing some work on organics at the moment through that system. And so what we're doing is taking it right back to the start again, okay, so we've got thymol, 
Uh, we don't know the mechanism of how it works. We think it's probably vapour. It, is it contact or is it oral? We don't know. So what we're doing is just looking and developing these bioassays for all of these different ones and uh, seeing how it actually affects the varroa. And then once we know how it affects, affects the varroa, then we put that into a beehive situation. How does it affect it there? And, and then we can start to get a really good idea as to how thymol would impact on varroa and then theoretically formic acid and oxalic acid would charge it with all of those, depending on how long the funding goes for. Has, has funding been um, sourced for that yet? Or? Uh, so, so the organic stuff, yes, we've got one more year of funding for that. So that's good. <coughs> But in the but wine was always helpful. <laughs> I think there's always this is bringing up the question again of funding. And I alluded to that when I started. Um, you know, we've got to take control of this as an industry. Uh, we've got to start to deal with this problem universally and start to look at putting our hands in our pockets to start to tackle it and other issues. And I think probably just about now it's about quarter to four because I've got to leave at four o'clock and I'm taking Peter Franz and Peter Sales to the airport and dropping the car off. But I'd just like at this stage to just put out a bit of a poll among you people here today. Um, if we had a levy to fund bee research, be it for row or whatever, or market access, how many, hands up here, how many of you would support a, a levy? There's one person over here. So I could say then that there's almost a majority of you would support a levy to for bee research. Thank you very much. Not the best job in the whole industry. Not 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 something. A high, a high base levy. Also. <coughs> a fair levy. A fair levy. A fair levy. Details would have to be worked out, but the principle, the principle where it's going. I just asked that years ago we all paid 50 cents a hive levy for marketing. All that money was used and it was used to profile Manuka honey, those people produce Manuka honey benefit from that levy and got very valuable product and all the rest of us that financed it have got nothing. And things like honey do here that people want research, no money available. So I'm going to skip to about levies because I feel, um, I don't know, I sort of feel I'm paying the levy now for my RFP to food safety. I've paid a lot of levies already and I would rather pay a levy if it's going to be a Absolutely, it's got to be for it. Got to uh, improve your bottom line, but um, you know. we can't hear. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you've got to be conscious that the lift in the Manuka value has lifted all honey in New Zealand. Um, Peter Bray did an exercise looking back ten years. I think his buy price then was two dollars thirty two a kilo. He applied the uh, inflation rate adjusted by the Reserve Bank to it to bring it up to this year. It was about $3.90. Well, I can tell you, nobody in the room is getting $3.90 for the honey. They're well above that. How much more? I was over $3.60 last year. <laughs> <laughs> I was over $3.60 last year. I was over but... <laughs> Tell them no. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that money is better spent, um, or money from the levy is better spent in research uh, to do with bee health rather than marketing or promoting bee products as such because there's probably uh, plenty of private businesses around who, who, who do that role very well. So um, if it's to do, maybe use more to affect health, I think that's more likely to give uh, a more even benefit to the whole industry. And I might add that like we pay for the relief or we do pay money towards the industry for research and development um, because we consider it to be in our interest to do that, to support the industry. There's probably other businesses in a similar position to us who would support the industry. <coughs> Um, it seems to me that um, levies come and go in a cyclic pattern and the pattern generally <coughs> correlates with how well the levy is organised and how it's structured and um, what seems this, this industry happened and it went obviously because people got unhappy with how it was administered um, and who, who administered it and how it was spent and all that sort of carry on. All I'd say is if you get to do it again it's got to be done under a proper structure by the prior proper group 
I'm not saying who, but you know, you get you get a group of people like this in the room, everybody's got a different idea on how it should be spent and what it should be spent on. Um, it only works when it's administered properly, and I suspect everybody would have their hand up if they were confident of that. Okay, so I'll make the point that the funding currently is being administered by the Big Product Standard Council on behalf of all industry. It's got three shareholders, the NBA, Honey Packers Association, and the BIG. So they represent all those people who actually pay a sub at this current time. Um, the levies, the levy, the voluntary levies in place are a dollar a hive or twenty dollars a ton, depending whether you're a beekeeper or a packer and exporter. It's a managed fund. When you put your dollar in, you nominate where you want the, fun the funds to be applied. I think there are five options now of which research project you can apply your money to. So it's your choice. The, the question is, will you pay your dollar? Is, is um, it brew health? Can I say something? Is brew health? Uh, high health? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you need something that, that tackles the universal problems, as I've alluded to, for the universal benefit. I've, I've already paid you know, the dollar yeah. per hive, so I don't know. But I, I like to see levy of the whole industry. There's some very well to do beekeepers who out of everything and they're still benefiting of, of levy that a few people are paying. <laughs> and, and also, while I'm at it, we should be we're talking about United in front and United States, but nothing seems to be happening. Actually, I'm a member of both. Yeah, so, okay. so, well, yeah. if, if we are united, I give you, and I only have to pay one membership, you get a extra money yeah. for research. Okay. If, if, if there's one thing that the universal problem like Marara or Market Access does, it, make, it makes people start to work together and look at the universal problem, the universal solution. Um, so, yeah, I think you would agree with that, wouldn't you, John? Uh, one question over the back down here. Would not the most effective way to get the BSH gene out there be for the BPSA or private, primary industry government department to give a top quality BSH queen to each of the 200 commercial beekeepers that run 80% of the hives, that way all, and to use as a breeding queen. Paul, Paul would you like to answer this one? <laughs> <laughs> all we need is the money. <laughs> For 200 queen bees, every year. Every year. Not a big ask. <laughs> I'm gonna say, if it's not that big an ask getting that much money, then I'm sure you don't need the government to pay for it. <laughs> But actually just on that, I was just thinking about the efficiency of the rollout. So, Michelle, you might get out, but just how it was selected that we've got better bees and we've got rainbow honey. And we're going to be looking for two other suppliers in the North Island. Yeah, how, how, how's the rollout going to plan out uh, for the rest of the country? This is probably a really touchy subject. Oh, okay. um, no, no, good. I. <coughs> Um, we put out a article in the, the New Zealand Beekeeper, which was in the October version, which went to everybody, basically asking for requests for anybody who wanted to come and champion this. There was five people that uh, responded, uh, but they were just interested in buying the queens. They weren't actually interested in running a program. So um, we carried on for another two years, uh, and still we put it across the bee list to try and get somebody um, that didn't happen uh, and then basically we were about to close the program and um, voila. Right. So yeah, so we've got, um, and so Rainbow Honey turned up and nobody else did except these guys who bought some semen from the program. So all of the stock has now gone to Rainbow Honey uh, and yeah, so whatever they can make out of it is what they can make out of it. They've already spent a huge amount of money on it already um, at no return yet. So it's up to you guys to support that huge input that's already gone in. Yeah. But just to clarify how bit of ease we came involved, we, we were approached along with everyone else in the room whether we wanted to be an industry champion for the program. 
And at that time, we thought long and hard about that and realised that we weren't really in a position to do the kind of role that Rome Mahoney had taken on. Um, but th at that time, which was like a new year this last year, um, there was no obvious people putting their hand up to say, yes, we will do this. And our shareholders, uh, many of whom are NBA members and have put money into this project, and like a lot of other beekeepers, didn't want to see it fall over <laughs> for the one of someone else taking it over, you know, or at least putting some, you know, getting it legs to carry it forward. So what we said at the time was, well, we're not in a position to, to, to do this because we're already fully committed, you know, in our, in our own business in terms of our resources. But we were in a position, if you like, to capture that genetic material so it wasn't lost. Um, and um, and offered to do that. Um, and so what we have done is we had, a, I feel like, a small slice of that genetic material, which is at least, if at the time being, was, was captured. And we, we took the approach that that, um, that was really how we would like to do it, or we were able to do, and we were quite happy uh, at any other time in the future by maintaining that population to provide it back to industry. And in the meantime, the win-win for us is that we did have that material which would add to our own VSH work we've done, and um, you know potentially um, could be some benefit to our shareholders as well. So that you know that was our position. Yeah, from Rainbow, really we got involved right at the last we heard that the project was going to be closed down, so we thought it was too good to it closed down. So we looked at ways that we could perhaps pick it up and perhaps take it to that commercial area where it needs to go. Uh, question there on the follow-up from Ray. To actually succeed, you'll have to have an area that's um, free of other beekeeper and products for the pollution of their time. Yeah, uh, that's why I've studied a artificial insemination. We're going to do a closed population uh, breeding program as well as a open population. But you'll have to have a drone for um, a reasonable Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, we we will be banking the queen, the drone. Sorry, we we will be keeping them separate. Yeah. It's a, it's quite a large task. We've taken on, <laughs> but we know. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I must admit, I mean, Philip and I are really enthusiastic about it. I couldn't believe the the project had been kept in limbo. I've been out of the industry for ten years, and just so they happened to come back into it, and I'm yeah, I'm just really actually feel like I'm quite privileged to have it because it is an amazing project. If it can, and I know we can make it work, pretty much. Yeah, Ross, we have got two areas that we've sort of earmarked that have really got nothing set up. We live in a, kind of wheat, a lot of pine trees, so we're looking at those areas to sort of saturate them with drones to get as pure making as we can with the flying bees. I just want to touch on something that Mark said, and that is that the beekeeper is the only Probably if you shut down all bees coming in from the North Island, then you might have a chance of that. But I'd say because it's been around for probably a year, that you've probably already got pieces of it here, and it will only develop as we as we carry on using single treatments. So, as I hear, most of you guys are already alternating, which is fantastic. Pat on the back for you guys, you've done a great job, and you probably need to keep that up. But now it's just looking for some alternatives to support that as well. So you can, you know, do one every three years, you know, every three, um, third treatment is a different one, you know, so trying that one. Okay, just, <coughs> it's five to four, 
I think I'd just like to get, now go through perhaps the panel each if they've got any final statements, comments to make to you all before we uh, finish up. Would you like to start at the far end there, Ray, or have you got... <laughs> I think I said my piece just before. Um, yeah, no, I just would, um, hopefully, if anybody's got any questions, please don't feel free to contact us. And um, I'd really like to think that you're supporting us on this. Um, it's been a, quite a task to take on, but I really hope you're supporting it. Great, get in and support the program, give them really good feedback. I know it's not they're not going to be exactly the way that you want it to be in 100% straight off but this is reality and you've got a really good chance here to provide another piece in your toolbox that you can fight for all with. So I urge you to not let this trait disappear. Uh, I think we've already made that our position clear with what we're doing in our own company, but I'd just like to take the opportunity to support the idea of a levy, actually, because in a company we were trying to run a breeding program on a shoe stream. Getting enough money to do it is really difficult. Often when you go to government, of course, they say one for one or whatever, um, which is fine. But but the research, the whole thing is the research is, is chronically underfunded constantly. So if the beekeepers don't put money in, who is? So we go for that. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I think the need to, uh, message you need to take home is really that <clears throat> even though we've got the, the VSH will improve our tolerance, it's, no, it's not going to be a rapid gain. It will, it will occur, but don't expect miracles overnight. Every year it'll be, you know, one step, one step, one step. So don't expect the, um, <coughs> suddenly you're going to have to treat them, your hives um, overnight. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming along. It's great to see such a big crowd. Um, I'm trying to make everybody just being safe and funny now. I can't think of anything. <laughs> um, the industry's been through, you know, a reasonably stable period of, in terms of structures and things. And that's good after the you know, split in 2010 years ago now. But I think it is time to start looking at whether the structures we've got now are the structures we really need to take us into the future. I don't think any decision can or should be made too quickly, but I think it's time to start considering what the options are and starting to discuss the pros and cons of them. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for all coming along. Good to see young ones coming, especially Marco's baby over there. <laughs> Um, if you've got any questions, um, give us an email or ring us. The number's on that form that we have. Thank you. Again, thank you for tuning up. It's been a, this is how we communicate as, as an industry. It needs to be in a forum like this. And the only way you can benefit is to actually turn up and be there. So if there's a meeting going on in your region, make sure you attend it. Uh, can I also put out a reminder that the South Island should be smart enough to alternate their variety treatments and we should be able to slow down the resistant mite if we continue to do so. If we pursue the same tactics with others in the North Island, we're going to end up exactly where they are quite a lot faster. So just make, make, make good decisions. There are plenty of good people to talk to and get your treatments right. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you for coming along and being part of this. It has been a great day. I think you've all enjoyed it. You've hopefully learnt a, a lot more. You've tried to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, the next National Beekeepers Conference will be in Canterbury. Uh, that'll be in uh, June next year. So um, we'll be putting out more information on that as it develops. But uh, it will be the 100th year of the National Beekeepers Association. So we'll be celebrating that. But yeah, once again, just thank you all for coming, and um, yeah, I'm pleased it's been uh, such a, a well-attended uh, workshop. <laughs>